So welcome back to the Praying with the English Mystics Retreat. This is the third and final conference of this three conference retreat. This retreat is being sponsored, brought to you by Holy Cross Monastery of West Park, New York. And I'm Carl McCollman. I am the presenter for this retreat. Our topic today is an anonymous book from around the year 1375 from the late 14th century called The Cloud of Unknowing. And once again, to enter into our time together with the intention of this being a retreat experience, I'm going to invite us into prayer, but the invitation for today's prayer is simply to move into silence. So I don't have a prayer to share with you from Evelyn Underhill or from Julian of Norwich. But rather I invite all of us, myself included, to simply attend to the silence that's already within us between every heartbeat, between every thought, in that pause, no matter how small it might be, between our in-breath and our out-breath. So acknowledging the Holy Spirit who is in our hearts, acknowledging the God whom we can find in all things, let's just take a moment and rest in the silence. So in today's conference, I would like to introduce you, if you aren't already familiar with The Cloud of Unknowing. And then again, as, been the th as has been the theme of this retreat, we will focus in on what the cloud has to say about prayer. We're going to pay special attention to a concept that Cynthia Bourgeau writes about, objectless attention and how that ties in with the cloud's instructions for prayer. Then we'll reflect on how we can apply this 14th century wisdom to our lives, to our prayer practice here in the 21st century. And then finally, we'll wrap up by trying to weave all three of the voices that we've reflected on this week, Evelyn Underhill, Julian of Norwich, and the Cloud of Unknowing. So in this slide, we see the cover of an edition of the cloud that came out, I think, about 100 years ago. You can see it's kind of an old fashioned uh, book cover. And the title is lifted straight out of early manuscripts for this book. And so I think it's, it's really uh, worth reflecting on. This is a book of contemplation, the which is called the cloud of unknowing in the which a soul is one with God. And of course, if you were with us yesterday, you'll kind of recognize that phrasing because we saw that with Julian of Norwich, that prayer oneeth the soul with God. And so if we wanted to render this in a more contemporary English, we might say, this book of contemplation is called The Cloud of Unknowing, in which cloud the soul is united with God. And notice at the bottom, this particular edition of The Cloud was edited by our dear friend Evelyn Underhill. So obviously she was quite a fan of this text. And her, um, 
Her edition of The Cloud is still in print and is, is actually considered a fairly important edition, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. So I mentioned the author is absolutely anonymous, not like Julian of Norwich, where we can at least kind of give her a name because of the church she was affiliated with. The author of The Cloud, we have no idea who the person is. There is some speculation that the author was a monk. Uh, the theory that, that I think makes the most sense is that the author was a Carthusian monk. He has also been, it's also been suggested that he is a Cistercian monk. It's also been suggested that maybe he is a she. Uh, there are even, you know, some voices that suggest Julian of Norwich wrote The Cloud. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because they, they really are very distinct voices. But, um, you know, so I'm willing to let The Cloud author be The Cloud author. And, and, and I think what makes the most sense is that this was somebody living an austere monastic life, such as what the Carthusian monks would have lived. But again, at the end of the day, we simply don't know. The person that wrote The Cloud wrote several other shorter texts and also may have translated several other spiritual classics from Latin into Middle English. So the shorter texts that, are, that most scholars think were written by the same author include the Book of Privy Counseling. It's also called Private Counsel or, or Private Direction. And oftentimes, uh, contemporary English translations will bundle the cloud and Privy Counsel together. So, so those two are considered to be, I guess, the two most important works by this author. But then there's also two letters, a letter of prayer, a letter of discretion, and then these short translated works, and I should say very much free translations, uh, coming from Bernard of Clairvaux, Richard of St. Victor, and uh, Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, a sixth century, uh, probably Assyrian monk. But we'll focus today on the cloud, the longest and probably the most important text by this author. The author is writing to a specific person. The author doesn't tell us a lot about the intended reader, but at one point does mention that, that the person is 24 years old. So, um, and it's clear that the reader is somebody who is an aspirant to a contemplative spirituality. So the, you know, the likely scenario is that this is an older monk writing some advice on prayer to a younger monk. This is a book about how to pray. I mentioned yesterday that um, Julian of Norwich's book is more uh, of a poetic, visionary text in which she is basically telling her own story about her visionary experience and her theological reflection on that experience. The Cloud of Unknowing is much more nuts and bolts. It's much more, if you want to pray in a contemplative manner, this is how you do it. The author is very suspicious of supernatural experiences. As is often the case with monastic writing, there's a great emphasis on humility, of course, on love, and as the title suggests, on kind of this experience of unknowing as the heart of a mature prayer life. So I thought, um, that I would just offer a few suggestions for, for folks who are new to the cloud and would like to find, find books to read. Um, as, as I mentioned yesterday in talking about Julian, I think that you can make the case that it can be profitable to read a Middle English text like The Cloud of Unknowing in the Middle English. I find the cloud harder than Julian. I think it's a different dialect. It's a, a more Northern dialect. So, um, but that could just be me. But, um, but if you do want to try reading The Cloud in the original Middle English, look for um, the, the edition edited by Phyllis Hodgson. Um, unfortunately, it's out of print. Used copies are not cheap. So if you, if you want a less expensive option, there is a, a series of medieval texts. I think it's called the Teams series. And you can get The Cloud in Middle English like maybe for $10 off of Amazon. So that's another option you can look at. In terms of contemporary translations, I mentioned the Evelyn Underhill translation. It did come out 
over 100 years ago, 1912. And it, Underhill does not make any attempt to, to bring the language into the 20th century. So reading Underhill's uh, edition of the cloud is kind of like reading the King James Bible or the Douay Reims Bible. It, it still has kind of an archaic feel. But it's, but it's more accessible than going back to the, to the 14th century original text. So, so if you want some of the feel of, of the archaic language, uh, the Underhill edition is, is a good choice. And it is considered to be a, a fairly accurate translation. If you just want to go ahead and, and read something in more of a contemporary voice, then I'm going to go with the two translations that Cynthia Bourgeau recommends. And those are the Ira Progoff translation. This is the same guy who did the journal workshops. I think he's a Jungian psychiatrist. I may be wrong there. Um, but he translated this back in the 50s. So it, it's a little dated, but it's, um, you know, uh, uh, Bourgeau gives it very high marks for being a very, very accurate translation. And then, and then a much more recent translation that is my personal favorite is the Carmen Butcher translation. Carmen Butcher, I know Carmen, she used to live in Atlanta. Um, she's now uh, on the West Coast, but she's, she's an English professor. She taught at Shorter College here in Georgia. Um, and so she brings a, a certain kind of literary sophistication to her translation, but also a, a very kind of almost an informal quality. It really does feel like, like a letter that's being written between friends. And, she, and her, her edition is very extensively footnoted. So whenever she does anything that might be the least bit controversial, she gives you information to back up why she's doing that. Finally, if you want insight into the cloud from, from a commentator, for my money, the best place to start is with Cynthia Bourgeau's book, The Heart of Centering Prayer. Now, it's a book about centering prayer but a third of the book is devoted to commentary on not the entire cloud, but about seven or eight chapters of the cloud, which are probably the most important chapters in terms of the, the kind of real nuts and bolts instructions for, for the practice of, of prayer. So um, I just find her, her commentary is very lucid. It's very theologically nuanced. And, and I think, um, if, if your experience of reading, reading The Heart of Centering Prayer is anything like mine, reading it will really make the cloud come alive for you. Now, I, I'm not normally one to, to pick on translations, but I, I just think it probably is worth mentioning that two translations that, that have been very popular uh, are considered controversial. And those are the translation by Clifton Walters, which came out from Penguin Books back in the 1960s. I think it's out of print now. And I think the Penguin edition that's in print now is a different translation. Uh, so you might only find the Walters translation in a used bookstore somewhere. But then the William Johnston translation from Image Books, that is still in print. And I adore William Johnston. He, he was an Irish Jesuit who spent most of his adult life in Tokyo, writ, wrote a number of books about Christian Buddhist dialogue. Uh, really, you know, his, his, his voice is very down to earth and very much uh, kind of this beautiful celebration of kind of an East meets West spirituality. But uh, as Cynthia Bourgeau points out in The Heart of Centering Prayer, unfortunately, his translation of The Cloud of Unknowing is, is too much of a par paraphrase to the point that, that it is regarded as theologically imprecise. You can see this quote from Cynthia. If you use the Johnston edition, it will be hard for you to see the points I'm making because they're simply not there in his translation. So, you know, you, the Johnston translation was the first, the first copy of The Cloud of Unknowing I ever owned. It's, it's like I said, it's, 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 it's been out there for years almost 50 years now. So if you have that, if you love it, if it's, if it's the book you've read 20 times, I'm not telling you you need to throw it away, but, but maybe supplement it with the Progoff translation and the Butcher translation that are just a little bit more, um, just a little bit more accurate in terms of rendering the Middle English into contemporary language. Let me tell a little story. I used to work 
in the monastery bookstore at the Trappist Monastery here in Georgia. I was there for eight years. And of course, we sold, you know, I mean, all the books that we're talking about this week, we sold Julian, we sold Bourgeau, we sold Richard Rohr. Uh, we had The Cloud of Unknowing, all these various other books. One day, a young woman came into the shop and she was browsing and she picked up The Cloud of Unknowing and she read the preface. And then she marched right up to the cash register where I happened to be. And she said, I can't believe you're selling this book. And I said, what do you mean? And she opened up to the preface and she said, it says right here that you should not be giving this book to anybody who might not be ready for it. <laughs> and I said, well, that's true. That's what the author wrote back in the 1300s. And I'm just trusting the publisher and the monks who all say it's okay to sell this book. So here I am selling this book. But if, especially if you are somebody of a humble turn of mind, reading the preface might be a little surprising because the author actually is very clear in stating up front that he thinks this book should only be read by the person who is spiritually ready for it and who is truly desirous of embracing a contemplative spirituality. So for, for you know, any, anyone on the retreat today who, who doesn't have access to a screen, let me just read this little passage. In the name of love, I ask you, whoever you are, however this book came into your hands, if at all possible, don't read it to anyone or copy it or quote from it, and don't let anyone else read it, copy it, or quote from it, unless, in your opinion, that person is sincere in their intentions to follow Christ. Entrust this book only to those who for a long time have been doing everything possible in prayer and virtuous living to prepare themselves for the contemplative journey. Otherwise, this book is not for them. And he's just, he's just getting cranked up here. I hope that habitual gossips, boasters, flatterers, fault finders, busybodies, whisperers, liars, and character assassinators never see this book. I never meant to write anything for them. I don't want them meddling in these matters, nor do I want them merely curious, educated or uneducated, prying into the subject. Even if they're good people with active lives, it will mean nothing to them unless they're also inwardly stirred by God's mysterious spirit, allowing them to participate in contemplation at the highest level from time to time. Then through God's grace, even if they can't do this work unceasingly, as true contemplatives can, they'll find that this book will go a long way in strengthening and comforting them in all they do. Now, what I want to point out here is, you know, I think this is a glass half empty, glass half full kind of scenario. You know, like, like my, my erstwhile customer at the Abbey store, you know, what, 10 years ago now, uh, she just read this as being a giant stop sign. But even when I read it, in addition to just being amused by how vivid the author's language is, um, I, I should try to find it in the Middle English. Of course, I'm not very good at pronouncing Middle English. But, but he says, let me see if I can find it real quick. Hold on one second here. I know I'm getting off script here. He says, fleshly janglers, open praisers and blamers of himself or of any other, tiddling tellers, you know, and on and on it goes. So it's really this vivid language of people who he thinks should never read this book. But then he goes on to make a very interesting point. And this is what I want to underline, is that, he, you know, and again, consider that this person is probably a monk writing for another monk. But he goes out of his way as saying that that if you're inwardly stirred by God's mysterious spirit, who allows you to participate in contemplation, even just from time to time, even if you can't do this work unceasingly, as true contemplatives can, this book will go a long way in strengthening and comforting you and all you do. So he's actually making a very provocative statement saying this isn't just for monks, this isn't just for priests, this isn't just for 
the pros. This is for anyone who has an authentic sense of being called into a contemplative spirituality. And I think that's what's really important about the preface. Now, at the end of the book, the very last chapter, actually, the author also has, offers what he says are signs that you are truly ready for this, this spiritual journey. So in, you know, writing kind of um, writing to somebody who's doing discernment on behalf of somebody else, like a spiritual director, for example. First, let them see if they've done everything possible to prepare their conscience for this work. By this, I mean, have they purified it, following the observances of the Holy Church and the advice of their spiritual director? When this is done, that much is well. If they want more confirmation, let them see if the desire for contemplation presses on their minds at all times, attracting their attention more than any other spiritual discipline. Also, if their conscience can find no peace in any physical or spiritual good they do, unless they make this secret little love longing the primary spiritual reason for everything they do, then it's proof they are called by God to do this work. So I'm paraphrasing a little that I think all of us can kind of reflect on. You know, and the first question is, is your interest in contemplative spirituality, are you willing to share it with, with someone who can offer you kind of guidance and feedback or at least support? You know, the traditional idea would be a confessor, you know, depending on your, on your spiritual tradition, you know, working with a confessor may or may not be, be part of, of your spiritual practice. I think that's fine, but if you don't work with a sacramental confessor, then at least somebody who can be a spiritual director or a soul friend. I think what the author is saying here is don't get into kind of just this personal little ego trip that, you know, I think I'm going to go out there and find union with God, and I'm not even going to share it with anybody. He's like, you know, have somebody you need, you know, you need a ground crew, have somebody you can share this with. And then is this desire, is it, is it a consistent desire? Is this just a passing fancy? Or is this something that you're discerning is really truly part of who you are? This desire for silence, for solitude, for stillness, for, for exploring interior silence. You know, if it's just a little passing fancy, well, let it come, let it go. But if it's something that you notice is, is it, it hangs around, it, it, it sticks around, then it's probably something you need to be taking a look at. And then finally, do you find that your other spiritual commitments, and I think the assumption here is that you will have other spiritual commitments. You know, the, the, the good work that we are called to do, you know, if, if, if you're, you know, I mean, if you're a monk, are you doing your best to be a good monk? If you're a, a parish priest, doing your best to be a parish priest. If you're a school teacher or, a, you know, or a, a doctor, a, a nurse, what, whatever your vocation is, are you living your vocation with honesty and integrity? Are you, are you following the precepts of your spiritual path? I mean, if, if, you're, if your spiritual path is a Christian spiritual path, that also means having some sense of generosity, some sense of caring for others, maybe doing something to support those who are in need. All of that is kind of, this author is saying, you know, all of that is kind of ground level requirements for the spiritual life. But the key that you're really called to the life of contemplation is that that all only makes sense in the light of this hunger in your heart, this hunger for this union with God. Okay, so back to the, the title, A Book of Contemplation. Now, um, I think it's interesting because, you know, when we looked at Underhill and Julian, we see, we see some different perspectives on contemplation. Remember, with Underhill, there was kind of like this assumption that it was an advanced spiritual practice. Julian doesn't even use the word. And even in our own day, the, the spiritual practice that is most similar to what you'll find in the cloud, which is centering prayer, is presented as a way of preparing us for contemplation. But the cloud is very explicit. The cloud is like, this is a book about how to, be, how to, how to do contemplation. So what I want to do before we dive in, I just, I just have like one or two slides here. I want to I wanna situate the cloud in the longer history of contemplative spirituality, in, at least in the Christian tradition. And to do that, we really have to go all the way back to the desert mothers and fathers. 
and we can focus on, on two figures, uh, Evagrius and John Cashin. And, and in the writings of Evagrius and the writings of John Cashin are, are the first really significant voices in the tradition, at least as far as I'm concerned, who really articulate a kind of spiritual practice that involves moving into silence, that involves moving beyond the, the so-called monkey mind, beyond the, the, the distraction from distraction by distraction, into that place where thought begins to yield to simple love and simple adoration. Cashin, of course, is the one who suggests taking one Bible verse and repeating it as a way of moving more deeply into contemplative silence. In the Eastern Church, this eventually morphs into the practice known as the Jesus Prayer. If you've read the book, The Way of a Pilgrim, you know, or the anthology of spiritual writings called the Philokalia, you'll be familiar with the Jesus Prayer. The idea of the repetitive praying of a simple phrase like, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. That that entrains us, entrains us to our heartbeat, and entrains us to the silence between our thoughts. So it's out of that tradition that the cloud of unknowing shows up in the 14th century, again in the West, so a slightly different, different maybe heritage, but offering a manual on apophatic contemplation. We're going to come back to that word apophatic. I know that's, a, that's an SAT word. We're going to come back to it. The cloud of unknowing emphasizes the use of a simple prayer word, like love or Jesus, as our entry point into silence. And then this, in turn, brings us to the present day, where contemporary spiritual teachers like Cynthia Bergeau, like Thomas Keating, like John Main, uh, Lawrence Freeman, and others are calling Christians to a renewed contemplative practice, practices with names like Centering Prayer or Christian Meditation, that fall in this tradition of allowing silence to be the substance of our prayer. Okay, that word apophatic. Um, let's look at that in terms of another term, which is cataphatic. These are both Greek words. Cataphatic comes from a Greek word that essentially means to affirm a positive path that emphasizes encountering God through imagery, through art, through language, through poetry, through music, through architecture, through the senses, through nature, through the imagination, through the body. These are all ways that we can naturally connect with God. Uh, you see here echoes of Julian of Norwich, the fullness of joy is to behold God in all, or Ignatius of Loyola, find God in all things. The cataphatic path celebrates the humanity of Christ, celebrates all of our artistic efforts to respond to divine love. It is, it is a path that's very comfortable with verbal prayer, with, with saying our prayers, with reading prayers, with the liturgy, with the divine office the rosary, all of these kinds of prayer practices really point to this cataphatic approach to spirituality. Apophatic comes from a Greek word that essentially means to deny or, or, or to withdraw. This is a, quote, negative, unquote, path. And I, I put that in quotation marks because it's not negative in the sense of nihilistic or cynical, you know, or unfriendly. It's just negative in the sense that it is a path that is comfortable with darkness, with absence, with silence, and with unknowing. This is a path that, that suggests whatever we say about God ultimately fails. It's never adequate. Every, that's how I like to put it. Everything that in, in terms of human language or human thought or human culture Everything that reveals God also in some way conceals God. So this path emphasizes what we do not and cannot know about God. God is ultimate mystery. God is ultimately hidden. It ultimately suggests we need to turn away from words, concepts, images, or any other means of relating to God, and to embrace the God whom we find in darkness, silence, nothingness, emptiness, and unknowing. So this is a, a spirituality that, that can actually be more comfortable 
with a contemplative practice that takes us beyond words. Little bit of history here. The Centering Prayer Practice, which has become very popular in the last 40 years or so, was developed by three Trappist monks up in Spencer, Mass., only one of whom is still alive, William Menninger, uh, Thomas Keating, and Basil Pennington were the other two. But Menninger was the one who actually originally sat down and basically kind of developed the method of praying, which we now call Centering Prayer. But what not everybody realizes is that when Menninger first came up with this, his primary source was the cloud of unknowing, and he actually called the practice the prayer of the cloud of unknowing. That, that's kind of a clunky name. It, it, it doesn't mark it too well. So, so they took this, this notion of meeting God in our center, which comes really out of the writings of Thomas Merton, and came up with that much more kind of evocative name for the method, Centering Prayer. But I think it's important to really acknowledge. And, it, and it's interesting. I don't know if you find this as much in the Anglican world, but in the Catholic world, there, there are some people who think that Centering Prayer, because it has superficial similarities to transcendental meditation, they, they think Centering Prayer is somehow New Agey or, or not Christian. It's like an import from, from outside of the church. You know, the, uh, to, to be perfectly honest with you, my first thought is, and you say that like it's a bad thing, but I understand that there are some people for whom it's really important that their practice be, you know, a Christian practice. And to those people, I would simply say, read the Desert Mothers and Fathers, read the Cloud of Unknowing, read the Eastern Orthodox uh, spiritual teachers. This tradition that we now call Centering Prayer has very, very deep roots indeed, and they're all thoroughly within the Christian tradition. So here's why I think the cloud is just such an important document. Before the 20th century, it was the most explicit Western Christian document calling for a practice of prayer that resembles or is kind of harmonious with Eastern forms of meditation. Not identical. In fact, this is what's wonderful about Bergeau's book, The Heart of Centering Prayer, is she really gets down into the nitty gritty of how centering prayer practice is both similar to and different from your typical Eastern forms of meditation like shamatha or vipassana. But there certainly is, is a resonance and especially for somebody who is drawn to Eastern forms of spiritual practice, but whose, whose primary spiritual identity is Christian, centering prayer is a beautiful meeting point. So the cloud of unknowing is filled with imagery. And I just want to briefly touch on a few of these because we're going we're to run into them again and again as we start looking at quotations. Obviously, the primary image is the title image, and that is the cloud of unknowing. And the author, he, the author is so charming where he says at some point, you need to understand I am not speaking about a vapor in the sky. In other words, this is not a literal cloud, but it is a metaphorical cloud. It is, it is a symbolic cloud. It is a spiritual cloud that we encounter within ourselves. It is the cloud when we enter into it we acknowledge the limitation of our mind to intellectually grasp who God is and what it means to be in relationship with God. But it's not the only cloud that shows up in the book. The other cloud that the author speaks of is the cloud of forgetting. And here's, here's a way to think about it. If the cloud of unknowing is the mystery that separates us from, from the immediate presence of God, the cloud of forgetting is a similar veil that we draw between ourselves and all of our ordinary human level distractions. Anything that can interfere with our, our heart desire to simply put ourselves into the divine presence. So the author says, draw the cloud of forgetting over all of those other things and just let them go in the moment of prayer. Now, if you're an Ignatian, you might immediately say, but wait a minute, you know, the best thing to do is to pray about, you know, what's happening at work or your, you know, the fight you had with your spouse or, you know, the problem you're having, you know, with, 
you know, your teenager, whatever it might be, that, that we actually want to bring the stuff of our life into prayer. My response would be, it's not either or, that there is certainly a place for praying through the ordinary stuff of life. But this particular discipline of prayer is a, a way of praying that involves gently letting go anything that engages the mind and the emotions and that takes us from that place of just gentle silence. The author has this charming image of a dart, a dart of longing love. And the idea here is that we cannot, we cannot pass through the cloud of unknowing with our minds, with our intellect, with conceptual knowledge. But what can take us through the cloud into the heart of God is the love in our own hearts. So the cloud of unknowing becomes very much a heart-centered prayer. It is a prayer of heart speaking to heart, of love responding to love. And this, this start, this idea again, is that we, we send our love forth to God, who is the source of all love. And that love is what takes us through the cloud into the divine presence. The author follows an old tradition Taking the gospel story of Mary and Martha, you remember the story where Martha's working hard in the kitchen and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. And finally, Martha gets a little frustrated and she makes a comment to Jesus. And, and, and Jesus basically says, I don't want to get in the middle of this. But he, um, you know, he says, you know, what, what Mary has chosen will not be taken away from her. You know, let, let, let Mary be who Mary is. And especially in, in medieval times, this was interpreted that Martha represented kind of the active life, what, what, we, what we would call a secular life. And Mary represented a contemplative life or maybe a monastic or religious life. And of course, there's this subtle kind of hierarchy here that, that, that Mary has chosen the better, the better part, that the contemplatives are somehow higher on the, on the hierarchical scale. And so, so there's, you know, in some ways that, that metaphor really doesn't work, especially here in the third millennium. But it, but it was a metaphor that was, that was promoted, obviously, primarily by the merry types, by the monastics, you know, for quite some time. And the cloud of unknowing certainly makes use of that. One of the most charming um, uh, passages the author talks about uh, what he calls the devil's contemplatives. If you're familiar with a book called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, the Shambhala Buddhist, uh, you'll have a sense of what he's getting at here. Uh, spiritual materialism, or, or, or the devil's contemplative, is basically somebody who embraces contemplation for the wrong reasons. That they're not seeking intimacy with God, but they're seeking a spiritual high. They're seeking kind of a, a, a spiritual kick, if you will. And, and the author, he's, he's actually quite humorous in which he, he describes them almost kind of like scrunching their face up to kind of engineer this spiritual high. And, and he's really rather kind of dismissive of the whole thing. Uh, it's not an important part of the book, but it's humorous. And I think it's chapter 45. So if you want to, if you want to, you know, hear him rant a little, you already, already saw how he ranted at, uh, in the preface, but there's another example of that. And then the final image I want us to focus on is this notion he calls the atom of time. And what he suggests is, is that the atom is the smallest indivisible unit of time. Now, right away, we will sit here and think, well, you're, 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 you're talking about a nanosecond, you know, or I don't know what's smaller than a, a nanosecond. I think the smallest unit of time is called the Planck, the Planck unit or the Planck time. But um, the, you know, the, we think of the atom as, as an infinitesimally small unit of matter. But the author is using that word in this sense of an indivisible unit of time. And what he talks about, he, he kind of goes on and on about how we will be responsible for every atom of time given to us. And as you read it, the sense that I come away with is that what he's really trying to say is that your practice must be grounded in the present moment. That, that there's only one place 
where you can practice, where you can enter into prayer. And that's right here and right now on this knife edge that separates past and future. That this, this tiny moment that is now, that's the atom of time. And that's what, where we are invited to situate our heart and our minds as we enter into prayer. So the brilliance of the cloud of unknowing is how it artfully encourages us to use our spiritual imagination, the clouds, the dart, to bring us to a place of prayer beyond the imagination. So just a couple of quotes that we're going to look at. Uh, every rational creature, every person, every angel has two main strengths, the power to know and the power to love. God made both of these. But God's not knowable through the first. To the power of love, however, God is entirely known because a loving soul is open to receive God's abundance. Each person loves uniquely, and God's limitless, limitlessness can fill all angels and all souls that will ever exist. God will never stop loving us. Consider this truth, and if you by grace can make love your own do, for the experience is eternal joy, its absence is unending suffering. So the heart of prayer, according to the cloud of unknowing, is love. That knowledge, knowledge has its place in the life of faith. Jesus says, love the Lord with your, your whole mind as well as your whole strength, and your whole heart. But the author says that love ultimately takes us farther than, than, than philosophy or, or sophistry ever can. Through God's grace, our minds can explore, understand, and reflect on creation and even on God's works, but we can't think our way to God. That's why I'm willing to abandon everything I know to love the one thing I cannot think. God can be loved, but not thought. That's a, that's a really profound statement. God can be loved, but not thought. By love, God can be embraced and held, but not by thinking. It is good sometimes to meditate on God's amazing love as part of illumination and contemplation, but true contemplative work is something entirely different. Even meditating on God's love must be put down and covered with a cloud of forgetting. Fascinating idea that when we enter into this form of prayer, even spiritually inspiring thoughts, even kind of sensations of feeling close to God, those may have their place, but this gesture of openness, this gesture of entry into silence is not that place. Set even the most exalted thoughts aside to be still in the silence. At the very end of the book, he says, it is not what you are or what you have been that God sees with God's all merciful eyes but what you desire to be. I love this quote because I just see a really high theology of grace there and a high theology of mercy, that God meets us with love and mercy. And it's a beautiful thing. The love of Jesus is your help. Love Jesus and everything Jesus has is yours. Again, this idea that love, love is the foundation and the heart of all prayer. So what does the cloud say about prayer? First, it suggests, again, remember this is metaphorical language. Lift up your heart toward God with a humble stirring of love. It, it reminds me of the Sursum Corda during the Eucharist. You know, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Interesting. Begin by thinking only of God, but not even of any good that might come from God. So just try to set aside any thoughts about God's action, God's works. God's blessings, but to just seek to rest our consciousness, our attention on God. Consent only to the action of God in your will and your intellect. And of course, this reminds me of centering prayer where the emphasis is on the gesture of consent. Persevere. So you rest your attention on your desire for God, and guess what? We are distracted from distraction by distraction. Our minds will wander. So we bring our attention back. And at first you may find that all you are aware of is darkness or nothingness. This is the cloud of unknowing. So this idea, you know, think about Julian and her idea of seeking and seeing. Isn't seeking really 
the prayer of the cloud of unknowing, this moving into this place where we may only be aware of our, our longing, our sense of absence, our sense of God as being hidden behind a veil of mystery. The author of the cloud is saying, that's right where you belong. So what do we do when we enter the cloud? Well, we place our intention in, in a willful, naked intent towards God. Just it's like existentially, my awareness is that I hunger for God. I desire God. And then accept that we have, here's humility, we have no way of making the cloud magically disappear. The, the, the darkness and the cloud actually become the habitat for contemplative prayer. This is a prayer of mystery and unknowing. So the cloud holds us back from seeing God through the light of our mind, our understanding, and can even hold us back from feeling God in the sweetness of love and our affection. So the dart of longing love does not necessarily mean that we're going to have all sorts of cozy, happy feelings. It's just, again, it means love is an act of will, even more so than necessarily a lovely feeling. There's nothing wrong with lovely, lovely feelings, but there's something deeper than that. And then the idea is rest in the darkness. Don't fight it. Beg God, for, you know, beg God that you love. Beg God for God's presence, for God's mercy, for God's grace. But acknowledge that the mystery, the cloud, the fog will always be a part of this prayer of darkness and hiddenness. So the cloud of, of forgetting, this is a long quote. I'm, I'm not going to read the entire quote here, but the, the slides will be on, on YouTube. So if you want to go back and copy it, or better yet, just go to chapter five of the book and, um, and you can find it there. But this idea, again, is that all created things, ultimately, they, they can be good, they can be evil, they can be beneficial, they cannot be. There is a time and a place to pray for the ordinary stuff of creation. But the, the prayer of the cloud is the prayer of just letting everything else go. Putting that cloud of forgetting beneath you, between you, and everything that was ever created. Every, every thought you hold it's just another way to distract yourself from God. Now, if you're like me, that's a bit of a mind blower, you know, because I'm used to kind of my sense of self is pretty much tied in with thought. The idea of, of, of casting out from thought into pure silence is a little kind of, a little kind of scary almost. The author is saying, but that void, that sense of emptiness, that sense of silence is precisely where the love and grace of God meets us. As, as he puts it down at the bottom, you can see this, God's naked being. It is far better to think of God's naked being and to love and praise God simply for God's own self. So the author suggests the use of a sacred word. And the idea is that any time a thought or a distracting feeling or emotion rises up, we need a, reason, a, 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 a means to turn our attention back to the mystery of God. So, so it begins with this idea, you know, you, you might just say, I want God, I seek God, and nothing but God. But then this idea that, well, maybe we need to use love to just let go of all distractions. The love of God becomes kind of our focus point. But then this idea that, that no matter how long you've been praying, no longer, how long you've been meditating, that um, you'll always have to turn away from distractions and to turn back into the silence where you encounter the love of God. So the author suggests, if you want to have this intention, this intention of prayer, wrapped and enfolded in one word so that you can hold on to it better, Take only a short word of one syllable. That is better than one of two syllables. For the shorter it is, the better it agrees with the work of the Spirit. He gives, he gives a couple of examples. God or love. Choose whichever you wish or another as you please. Whichever you prefer of one syllable and fasten this word to your heart so that it never parts from it, whatever happens. If you are a practitioner of centering prayer, this all sounds really familiar. <laughs> 
This word is to be your shield and spear, whether you ride in peace or in war. With this word, you are to beat on the cloud and the darkness above you. With this word, you are to hammer down every kind of thought beneath the cloud of forgetting. So if any thought forces itself on you to ask what you would have, answer it with no more than this one word. Now, I want to point out here that the author uses rather militaristic imagery here, this idea of, of a shield and a spear, of beating on the cloud, and of hammering down every kind of thought. Centering prayer tends to use less. Um, less martial language. There's much more this idea, it's like letting go of a feather, this idea of ever so gently returning to the sacred word, which I think is probably more helpful for most of us. But um, maybe that just shows how, you know, how we've matured a little bit in 600 years. So now I'm going to pivot to Cynthia Bergeau real quick. I'm real conscious of time, but, um, but let's just try to try to uh, look at what, what Cynthia has to say. We, we talked a little bit about this notion of non-duality yesterday that, 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 that uh, Julian touches on this. The cloud of unknowing does too. And so Cynthia proposes to break open the cloud through this lens of what she calls objectless awareness, an unnamed but obliquely recognized quality. She says that this is not just Christian love mysticism like you might find in St. Bernard of Clairvaux or St. Therese of Lisieux or St. Teresa of Avila, nothing against any of that. But she says what the cloud is, is really teaching us is something different. She calls it the earliest Christian exploration into the phenomenology of human consciousness. That what the author is actually suggesting is that this form of prayer teaches us a new way of seeing. And, and Bergeau says, which he astonishingly equates with contemplation. So I think what Bergeau is pointing out is that not all contemplative teachers reach kind of this level of subtle nuance that you find in the cloud of unknowing. That the, that he, the cloud of unknowing may in fact be naming the closest point of equivalency between traditional Christian spiritual practices, formulations, she says, and our contemporary understanding of the spirituality of non-duality, non-dual consciousness. Imagine that there might be a different way of structuring the field of perception, an alternative way of wiring the brain that did not depend on the initial kind of bifurcation of the perceptual field into inside and outside. I know this is elevated language, but this idea that we learn early on in life, probably the first two years of life, we learn to see the world in terms of dualities. What's inside, what's outside, what's me, what's not me, what's up, what's down, what's good, what's bad, what helps, what hurts, what, what, what causes pleasure, what causes pain. And there's a level in which that makes great sense because that helps us navigate through life. But it, it can also create subtle problems. I mean, think about the problems that arise because of racism, sexism, homophobia, heteronormativity, those kinds of things. Those are all fundamentally based on a dualism that sees some people as better than others. So this is the problem with dualism is that we immediately then projecting, we project judgment onto it. And we know that Jesus went after our, our tendency to judge as well. So this idea, what non-dual consciousness suggests is that rather than seeing the world in terms of bifurcation, we learn to grasp the entire pattern as a whole, holographically, through a perceptual modality, quantitatively more immediate and sensate, working on vibrational resonance rather than mental abstraction. In other words, you got to love it. You can't just think it. It's, it's, it's intuitive. It's the knowing of the heart, not just kind of the cog cognition of the mind. Then we would indeed experience the signature sense of oneness, not because you had broken into a whole new realm of spiritual experience, but because the tedious translator mechanism of your self-reflective brain has finally been set aside. You see oneness because you see from oneness. The mind that does not need to separate and exclude in order to perceive reality will encounter far less resistance in the current of life 
and inflict far less violence on others. Okay, that, I know that's he heavy stuff and I'm kind of just powering through it, but I'm hoping that what you'll take from this is maybe a hunger to learn more, a hunger to actually engage in a practice like centering prayer and maybe, maybe do a little bit of research into, into contemplative thinkers like Cynthia Bergeau. So The Cloud of Unknowing is, is, is a classic work that gives us a historical grounding to this contemporary centering prayer movement. It shows us the roots of this movement. It's not just some new age fad that, that somebody thought of because they smoked too much pot back in the 70s. It has long, long roots in, um, in the history of Christian spirituality. But there are subtle differences between how the cloud of unknowing teaches prayer and how the contemporary centering prayer movement teaches it. So reading the cloud just gives us a richer or more nuanced understanding of how we can prepare ourselves for the grace of contemplation. Bergeau points out that the cloud actually is equivalent to fairly advanced Eastern meditation teaching manuals. And it can be a fruitful source for anyone interested in inner spiritual dialogue and practice. One of the things that she talks about in the Heart of Centering Prayer is that she has run into a kind of bias in the inner spiritual world sometimes that Christians just aren't as advanced as maybe Buddhists or Vedantists or practitioners of some of these other, you know, uh, spiritual practices from the East. And Bourgeau says, you know, the cloud of unknowing shows that the, the teaching in our tradition is every bit as advanced, every bit as nuanced and subtle as anything you'd find in other traditions. Not to say we're better, but to say that we, we have our own contribution to make. Okay, to, to wrap this up so we'll have a few minutes for conversation, let's look at, let's just summarize the retreat here. Evelyn Underhill provides us an accessible map of the path of contemplative spirituality, drawing primarily from Teresa of Avila but presenting it in a language that works for English-speaking Christians. Julian of Norwich provides us a solid theology of Christian optimism grounded in an image of God as joy, as divine love who desires intimacy with us. And finally, the cloud of unknowing strips away all language and imagery to invite us into that place of pure awareness where I and God are not two. So you may be asking, well, which one should I read first? And my response would be that the English mystics, like all spiritual writers, have their own personalities and their own unique perspectives on theology and spirituality. You may feel more naturally drawn to one or two or, you know, maybe not to any of these guys. You want to go off and read Richard Rohr some more. Trust your intuition. There is no one right map for the spiritual life. So let me offer a quote from another English contemplative teacher, uh, Dom James Chapman. He was a contemporary of Underhill's. He said, pray as you can, not as you can't. And a final thought. This comes from one of my first teachers, uh, Isabella Bates with the Shalem Institute. And she used to say, reading books about prayer is one of our favorite ways to avoid praying. And I'm telling you this as somebody who writes books for a living. Obviously, I'd love for you to buy all my books, and I'd love for you to buy them all from the Holy Cross bookstore. But this is still true. There comes a time when we need to set the books down. So make time to put down your book. And let us pray. Amen.